Yes, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, this evening we're going to be talking about a proposal to surplus or essentially dispose of uh, to the private sector approximately eight acres of property that the city owns in the northwest quadrant of the city. So the proposal is to advertise approximately eight acres of the, what we refer to as the green property for development, uh, specifically looking to target development uh, somewhere along the senior housing uh, spectrum. <clears throat> So for a little bit of uh, context for folks in the audience or watching online, this is the uh, overall aerial of the city. This is Highway 395 through there, Walmart, Home Depot. Uh, here's River Road, and this box outlined in red is the green property right next to the uh, Kibito River. <coughs> this is an aerial drone photo taken of the property back uh, about a month ago. Uh, looking to the west, this is uh, Northwest 11th Street. There's the Imadilla River, here's the city's recycled water treatment plant, and ironically, uh, the green property is basically everything that is brown, that you can see there. Um, the parts that are green is uh, right through here, this is the Hermiston Irrigation District, owns the Hermiston Drain property. They have a 30-foot easement, uh, they're well outside of their easement currently, it's just an open uh, ditch, uh, largely wetland. Also, it's a little bit difficult to see from this uh, image, but um, the brown, where the brown turns to green there is basically a ridge line that overlooks the river, and the green parts are the tops of a pretty heavily wooded um, area that's down in the floodplain. Uh, there's about three or four acres there that are part of the property that are in the floodplain and out the front on the river, but it's a pretty steep uh, drop down to the river from there. So the property itself is about 20 acres, as I mentioned. It was acquired in 2005 for $420,000 from the Green family. Uh, at the time, the property had a single family home and a couple of shops and outbuildings uh, on the property. Those have all since uh, been demolished and removed uh, through the process. Uh, back in 2006, the reason that the uh, property was acquired was we ran several uh, pilot tests on the property uh, to see if we could apply our treated uh, sewer effluent onto the, the property and allow that uh, effluent to percolate down through the sandy well-drained soils uh, before it reached the Matilla River. The, the reasoning for this is uh, because the, the water itself is generally free of any kind of uh, biological contaminants or pollutants uh, because it's already been treated, but it does still carry the pollution, one pollutant in the sense of uh, temperature. Uh, temperature can be a pollutant in a salmon-bearing stream uh, because salmon need uh, colder water, and so uh, DEQ had uh, instructed us to stop discharging that warm temperature water to the Umatilla River uh, in the summertime. And so we ran several tests uh, to see if uh, this would be a viable uh, alternative uh, for us. Uh, ultimately, those tests uh, proved to, that it simply wasn't going to work, mainly because the particulate matter that still was in the uh, discharge uh, essentially gummed up the sand filter that we were, were using in the form of the, the property. And so. Uh, in the meantime, since 2006 and now, uh, you're all well aware, we spent about $21 million upgrading the treatment process out at the recycled water treatment plant to a point that we now send our summertime discharge to the irrigation district and put it directly into their uh, irrigation water so it's no longer sent to the Imatilla River. So the, the purpose for the original acquisition of the property is no longer uh, necessary. We'd also installed uh, about seven monitoring wells around the entire property to ensure that uh, we didn't have any sort of uh, contamination uh, seeping into the groundwater. The property itself is inside of the city limits. It was annexed into the city limits when it was acquired, uh, but it's mainly surrounded by county. Uh, the recycled water treatment plant itself is also inside of the city limits, but to the west, south, and east of the property uh, is all inside of our urban growth boundary, but outside of the city limits. And the property is uh, zoned for R1 uh, residential, uh, and essentially all of the properties to the south of there until you hit around uh, Elm Avenue by the hospital. Uh, that entire area in our comprehensive plan uh, inside of the urban growth boundary is planned for residential development as well. So what the proposal actually is, what we mean by this eight acres, you can see the red outline is the current approximately 20 acres of the property. What we're requesting is uh, just simply authorization to proceed with advertising and soliciting to see if there's any interest in uh, surplusing approximately these eight acres outlined in white. I'll get into a little bit more in a little bit, but uh, you can see just kind of that uh, general development pattern is just simply more of a, uh, a fit test to see uh, what could fit uh, potentially uh, on a 
broad uh, scale on that eight acres. And so uh, generally what you'd see here is a two-story, 90,000 square foot assisted living facility and associated required parking, uh, 50 foot wide uh, street right of way, and 14, uh, 3,200 square foot homes that would be, uh, could be uh, utilized as uh, 28 duplex uh, uh, residential units. So uh, the, what that means for the balance of the property, the remaining 12 acres, uh, generally, as I mentioned, um, when we were looking at the, the drone footage, this is the heavily wooded area that is inside of the floodplain, so we can't build anything on it, uh, even if we wanted to. So the recommendation would be to retain uh, that portion of the property just because there's a strong public interest in retaining uh, that part of the property in public ownership uh, to preserve access to the river. But then also you can see this lighter green area that I've highlighted there, that's the Hermiston drain. The blue areas is generally, and I'll talk about it more in a little bit, is just simply well down the road. Um, we're gonna take this one project at a time. We're not talking about doing this now, but uh, because of the topography of the property out there, the blue area could be relatively easily excavated uh, to bring that down a little bit more to expand this wetland area. If we ever did want to, uh, expand that to be able to, to handle more of our stormwater runoff from our city streets in the city and be able to send that to the Hermiston drain. So those are some of the uses that we've seen for the property. So in retaining the Hermiston drain and the property fronting on the Umatilla River, this is a very rough approximation of the eight acres that we'd be looking to surplus now that lies on the property. Uh, city Council has a number of goals um, for 2020, uh, as you always uh, do in this year. Uh, you uh, chose to specifically call out fiscal prudence as a goal um, to make sure that we're maximizing the resources that we have uh, from the citizens and the ratepayers. So in that uh, interest of uh, achieving fiscal prudence, um, I think it's important uh, that we recognize really what the asset is that we have there, uh, that you know, what we could extract the value out of. It's important to remember that uh, through the process, uh, after we've acquired it, we damaged the, the value of the property in several ways. I remember there was a single family home on the property that had to be demolished. Uh, there were several uh, outbuildings and structures that had uh, financial value. Those had to be demolished for the process. And then uh, not the least of which we applied uh, about 200,000 gallons of treated uh, wastewater effluent onto the site, installed several groundwater monitoring wells. Uh, and so the, those two components particularly are most likely to just simply uh, spook potential uh, institutional investors if they may be looking at acquiring the property. Uh, the last thing that somebody looking to actually develop the property wants is to, to take on some sort of major uh, ecological headache that they have to remediate and, and spend a lot of money to, to do those sorts of things. So I believe that even though it has been 15 years uh, since the property was acquired, I think that even if we were to simply auction off the entire site, uh, the entire site, not just the southern eight acres, uh, it's, it's pretty unlikely that we would be able to recoup the original $420,000 investment. And then also it's important, I think, to understand not just understanding what the asset is, but also understanding what is likely to uh, be the development pattern on the property. Uh, if you take a drive out through that neighborhood, it's very obviously a, a rural residential setting. Um, most of the properties out there are, are typically a, a single home with some uh, barns and outbuildings, those types of things, on some amount of uh, larger acreage than what you would see inside of the city. So anywhere from one to 10, 15 acres in some instances um, where they're really geared more toward a, a rural residential setting. Uh, also, you gotta remember, I mean, I'm not um, oblivious to the fact that the property is right next to the, su the sewer treatment plant. I think uh, a lot of folks may, uh, when they see this proposal, think that it's uh, obnoxious or, or uh, absurd to try and put residential right next to the sewer treatment plant, uh, but as evidenced by the fact that there is uh, a lot of people actually that live out there currently, uh, people are willing uh, to live uh, in that proximity to something like that uh, facility that we have out there. And so looking at the surrounding properties, uh, the real market value according to the assessor's website of the surrounding properties ranges anywhere from $200,000 to $500,000. That includes both the land and the improvements uh, to the properties. So the most likely development pattern that we are uh, likely to get if we were to just simply you know, put this out there for auction and say whoever's the highest bidder, you know, go, you've got it. We'd most likely, I believe, end up with just a, a single home, a barn, and maybe some other improvements for some, you know, horse riding or, you know, those types of things. And so, really, I think even if we were to auction off the entire property, that's most likely what we would 
get. And I think the reason for that is, as I mentioned, institutional investors, if they're looking to develop the property for profit, uh, they're looking at what the revenue is going to come in off of each acre that it is that they're purchasing. And so um, they simply aren't going to be able to develop um, something like the Hermiston drain, uh, or they're going to have to put in really costly mitigating efforts like piping it and those types of things. And there's just simply no way that they're going to be able to recoup any revenue off of uh, paying for those three or four acres fronting on the river in the floodplain. Uh, meanwhile, what I think you would really likely see is you'd have some uh, potential purchasers who would just be thrilled to be able to obtain 20 acres of property, um, have kind of their slice of rural living uh, right adjacent within a couple minutes of the relatively urban amenities uh, offered inside of the city limits. And so I think they would probably pay a premium, uh, fra frankly, to have that uh, Umatilla River frontage and those types of amenities, whereas the potential development community uh, sees that as a liability and not an asset to something that they would be uh, bidding on. So when we look at uh, what the potential financial return would be for the property if we were to just simply open it up and take whatever the highest uh, bid is, um, we have to take into a number of uh, things here. I looked at, again, on the assessor's website, uh, the average real market value for uh, 18 properties nearby to this property, very similarly situated in proximity to the recycled water treatment plant. For properties inside of the city limits, like our property is, and that have uh, water and sewer utilities immediately adjacent to the property, like our uh, property does, the average price per acre comes out to about $43,000. And then additionally, looking at uh, just the improvements, so not taking into account the underlying land, but just the improvements, the value of the homes and barns and outbuildings, those types of things for all of the surrounding properties there, whether they're inside of the city or outside of the city, uh, the average assessed value for those came in at about $182,000. So when you take all of that uh, together, I think it's uh, relatively reasonable to assume that if we were to simply uh, put this out for auction, uh, for eight acres, uh, we'd probably be able to receive somewhere in the neighborhood of $325,000 uh, in a sale price, um, but then also you have to take into consideration what are the other revenue generating activities that the city could receive from that property if we were to do that. If we were to assume uh, the placement or construction of a $300,000 home on the property in addition to the $325,000 paid for the, the land itself, over the course of 20 years, the property tax revenue paid to the city uh, from that property would come in at about $58,000. Additionally, um, if they were to develop a home on that property being inside of the city limits and adjacent to all of the adjacent utilities, they'd be required to hook up to city sewer and water services. And so just the water and sewer utility base fees, uh, not including any of the consumption uh, component, would come out to about $15,000 over the course of 20 years. So. I believe uh, even if I'm off by a factor of you know, 20% on this, I think um, the total revenue that I think we could expect to come to the city over the course of 20 years if this property was just purely auctioned is probably going to be in the ballpark of between $300,000 and $500,000. So uh, then you have to compare that to what some of our other, other options are for maximizing the value of the property to the city. And again, and one of the council's other goals is in developing senior housing and so uh, trying to look at what is uh, potentially a, a highest and best use and development of the property from a, a value return standpoint again this is showing a 90,000 square foot two-story assisted living facility and uh, 14 uh, 3200 square foot homes split into duplex units and so uh, this assumes purely giving the property away for free. And so this is based off of the uh, razor and blades pricing model uh, where you give away a dependent good such as a razor blade handle, uh, but then you uh, leverage that to uh, generate recurring profit in the future by then selling the supporting good, i.e. the disposable razor blades. Um, so that's a, a pricing model that's been around since the early 1900s, uh, pioneered by the Gillette Corporation uh, to great success. Uh, and this is a, a pricing model in theory that's been around in the finance and economic uh, world for quite some time. It's had a lot of um, research done on it. And the major um, threat to that type of pricing model really only comes in the form of when you have competition for the supporting good that you're providing. So in the instance of uh, razor blades, if uh, another manufacturer comes along and is able to manufacture a, a blade that fits your handle perfectly, then all of a sudden you're competing with a competitor on the price of your razor blade. 
In our instance, where our supporting good is property taxes and utility fees, uh, by law, we have no competition uh, for that. So in this instance, uh, if we were to simply give away that property uh, in exchange for somebody committing to develop it to a pretty high standard uh, from an intensity standpoint, uh, I think we could see uh, upwards of $7 million in assessed valuation built out there. Looking at the existing assisted living facilities uh, in the city uh, already, uh, the average assessed value is in the ballpark of around $3 million. Additionally, 28 duplex units across 14 structures uh, based off of uh, recent new construction duplex units in the city would be also in the ballpark of around $4 million. So again, using the razors and blades pricing model, if you simply give away the, the land uh, for free over the course of 20 years, if we assume $7 million in assessed valuation, that would be a return to the taxpayers of the city of about $1.1 million. And then additionally, on the utility base fees, again, not assuming any of the consumption, which would be over and above that at $1.8 million, the net return to the city after giving the dependent asset away for free is almost $3 million. So on, uh, additionally, the city council's goal for housing, um, it's pretty uh, straightforward as far as uh, one respect that uh, simply giving away the asset uh, for free in exchange for somebody developing housing is one direct uh, way of developing housing and stimulating additional housing uh, growth. But I think probably the, you know, that's the, the smaller benefit in terms of housing development and stimulating additional housing. Uh, the real benefit is um, in the sense that like it or not, we are in uh, Oregon, and Oregon has very strong uh, urban growth boundary laws. And uh, so what that means is uh, if we want to be able to develop urban level services and, and uh, develop down uh, some of these uh, properties like the one across the river that are uh, high value uh, farmland, we have to prove that we've filled up our existing urban growth area that has been set for us uh, almost 50 years ago now. and so. We have to grow into that before we'll be allowed uh, to expand our urban growth boundary. So this uh, image I, I like because this is looking to the south-southwest. You can see the Hermiston Butte in the background, uh, the balance of the city over there. Uh, the northern boundary of the urban growth boundary is approximately in line with where the drone is flying here. You can see the Imatilla River, which is also the, the western boundary of our EGB. And you can see projected on the property, this is again a very rough approximation of the property that would be given away. If you drive out into that neighborhood and you come down Northwest 11th, it can feel as though it's already somewhat um, broken up and developed um, more so than other uh, rural areas. But once you get back to what I consider to be second tier lots off of uh, Northwest 11th, you can, you'll see that there's actually quite a, a large number of relatively large uh, properties that are otherwise uh, fairly developable. Um, and just they've kind of been waiting uh, for development to come out and reach them. And so. I believe that if we were to just simply write this area off and say, oh, well, it's right next to the recycled water treatment plant, who would ever want to live over there? Uh, when it comes time to expand the urban growth boundary, um, the state doesn't really care um, if we have too high of standards and don't want to develop something next to the recycled water treatment plant. And so uh, what this project, I think, is really about is creating something of a spatial and psychological barrier between all of these properties to the south and the recycled water treatment plant. So having essentially a, uh, a subdivision and a large institutional development out there really sets the tone just psychologically and physically when you're out in that neighborhood uh, that it really uh, creates a barrier between you and the recycled water treatment plant, which I believe will drive up the value of uh, development potential for these properties uh, to the south and again really set the tone and, and attract some interest from other developers who now would realize and not feel like they're building being the first ones building right next to their site of water treatment plant. Now they'll see a 10 acre field and say, okay, I can put uh, you know, 40 houses on that, uh, that property now. So that's really a lot of what this, pro this project is about. It's about setting the development tone up in that um, part of our urban growth boundary. Because as we've uh, set out with our Northeast uh, Hermiston Water Tower project, we're trying to, again, infill uh, our existing residential lands. And so I think we've got probably 10 to 20 years of additional development uh, potential up in that northeast quadrant of the city. Uh, and so doing something like this is really setting the stage so that then all of a sudden we don't experience a major drop off in uh, housing development uh, 15 to 20 years out in the future because uh, nobody really wants to develop out here because the tone hasn't been set. 
And then also one of the council's major goals uh, for 2020 is economic development. And uh, this is one of the, the things that I really like about this project. Uh, the economic development aspect here is uh, in senior living and stimulating health care jobs. Uh, elder care is a growing industry. I think a lot of folks have read and seen a lot about the uh, silver tsunami from the baby boomers as they've done through their entire lives. You know, the public institutions have had to make way for a large population coming through the pipeline, uh, whether it was elementary schools or colleges and all those sorts of things. And so as uh, baby boomers age into a, a point where they need some additional uh, care, uh, there's going to be uh, demand for additional health care jobs to provide that. And uh, senior care, by its definition, is, is very labor intensive. And so um, those types of jobs, you know, something like in an assisted living facility, I understand um, a lot of those are going to be things like uh, you know, food preparation and cooking and cleaning and, and kind of lower skilled um, health care type positions. But I think an additional one that's uh, difficult to really point to directly is something like a spin-off inducement of some uh, higher level medical uh, uh, professions because if we're able to basically attract an additional 120 uh, seniors to live in Hermiston and, and seek those services, you've basically added a, a large contingent of demand uh, for uh, medical services because uh, elder, uh, the elder population tends to access health care at a much higher rate. and so. You may have an existing uh, medical services provider in the city that may have uh, been considering whether or not to expand into a certain line of business or not, whereas currently it's maybe provided up in the Tri-Cities. Uh, just continuing to add uh, that type of demand can help uh, induce some of those additional uh, provisions in the community. And then additionally, uh, livability for working professionals. Uh, millennials generally tend to be the children of baby boomers, and so as uh, millennials boomer parents uh, reach an age where they need additional care, uh, that's going to be occurring right when millennials are reaching their prime wealth building years. Uh, I think millennials are currently defined as being between, I think, 25 and 40. Uh, that's really when most people are at their prime uh, wage earning and they're setting down roots and they're doing those types of uh, household activities that really build the most wealth. And so if you have somebody who was from you know, Union or Hepner or Goldendale or wherever it is that went away and became a a professional and they were able to find a job opportunity in Hermiston and they're starting to build that wealth but they have an aging family member somewhere else. Uh, adding these types of amenities to the community uh, just gives uh, that uh, working professional more ability to stay here and not feel like maybe they need to uh, seek new employment in like the Tri-Cities or someplace like that where they can uh, bring their aging uh, family member with them to another uh, living facility because there may not be as much in, this, in Hermiston currently. So before we look at uh, surplusing the property, you always want to consider what uh, potential alternatives the city could use the property for. Uh, the last thing we want to do is uh, get to a position where, uh, you know, 10 years down the road, all of a sudden, you know, we realize that you know, we really could have used that property. So um, I already mentioned a couple of those alternatives with just ensuring that we continue to have uh, future access to the Umatilla River and as well as the potential uh, use for uh, wetland uh, stormwater treatment area there. But in originally looking at the overall uh, property itself, uh, you'll remember the original purpose of the acquisition is now obsolete since we've upgraded the treatment uh, process and send our summertime discharge to the irrigation district. And then additionally, uh, I think one of the biggest questions is, uh, you know, we never want to shoot ourselves in the foot and strangle our own development. And so what kind of capacity does the recycled water treatment plant currently have? And would we need this property to expand on in, into the future? And so uh, the uh, kind of a, a generous assumption of uh, how we're operating at the recycled water treatment plant is that currently we're operating uh, at uh, somewhere less than 50% capacity. Uh, in, for most of the components, it's more closer to 30% capacity. but. Uh, worst case scenario, we're at about 50% capacity of the recycled water treatment plant in its uh, capacity. But then additionally, the recycled water treatment plant has uh, quite a bit of property to the north of this, which is also actually downhill of the property, which has a lot of uh, benefits in the sense of reduced pumping costs. Uh, but uh, the remainder of the, the recycled water treatment plant property itself, uh, we're currently only using less than 50% of the property uh, as it is. and so. When you uh, recognize the fact that based on our existing capacity and the area that we have to expand out on, we feel very strongly that the current site that we're on is easily capable of handling a population of more than 72,000 uh, people out into the future. And then also, 
for a sense of context, uh, Portland State University does population projections for the state and all the cities and counties. And back in 2016, they updated Umatilla County's population projections uh, and provided a 50-year projection. And so Portland State University projects that uh, Hermiston's population uh, 46 years from now, in 2066, will still only be about 41,000. So uh, I don't think that uh, we're going to be in a position where we want to hold the, hold the property for potentially you know, 100 years. Uh, we may not even really have the recycled water treatment plant in that location anymore 100 years from now. I already mentioned the potential for utilizing the, uh, the adjacent property uh, for stormwater uh, treatment. Again, that's not an immediate uh, project that we'd be looking at, but that's more just holding that uh, portion of the property in reserve so that, that could be a potential option for us in the future. And then additionally, a major one that uh, we put a lot of time in looking into was uh, its value as a recreational amenity. Um, I mentioned before um, the overlook on the Umatilla River is a, a pretty steep and high bank, about 20 to 30 foot bank. Really makes the river uh, more or less accessible from this uh, ridge line there. Uh, and again, it's pretty heavily wooded, and so I don't know what our ability would really be to do much logging down in there and really generate a lot of that access to the Umatilla River. Also, the topography of the, the property itself uh, is poorly suited for something that is a really large plain uh, that needs to be flat for things like uh, sports fields. Uh, you can do uh, the moving the, the soil around for doing smaller type placements like uh, individual houses, but for something that needs to be very large and flat, uh, it doesn't set up well for sports fields. Uh, also, uh, you just approved the uh, Park and Recreation uh, Master Plan that had been worked on for quite some time, and this is something we've known for even uh, before we started working on that update, is uh, about 70% of the park's acreage that we have in the city already, already exists on the west side of the city. Uh, there's a real lack of, of park's acreage on the east side of the city. And then also, just kind of where the, the property is situated, uh, up there, kind of in a corner by a river road, it's sandwiched in between the Umatilla River and the, the railroad branch line that runs through that area. So you're really not going to be getting kids from you know, the subdivisions over off of like theater and gear in that area. You're not going to get them walking across. I hope you won't get them walking across an active rail line. Uh, so most of the access to the property would be by uh, vehicle anyway uh, until it uh, develops uh, out uh, up in that area. And so also the, the proposal as it stands now uh, still allows for quite a bit of passive uh, park use potential up in that area. There's a lot of examples of wetlands just existing as open space, uh, passive park area, and uh, even though it is in the floodplain, I think there's still some potential use for that uh, property fronting along to the Utila River. So with that, uh, I hit you with a whole lot of information. Uh, the action that we're uh, requesting of you this evening is uh, simply, um, uh, it's equivalent to just saying, sure, go ahead, let's put a uh, for sale sign in our front yard and see what kind of interest we get uh, the action this evening doesn't commit you to accepting any kind of uh, development proposal. It doesn't actually surplus the property. So uh, this is uh, more just we wanted to make sure that we had this presentation this evening in a, a public session uh, and have it streamed on YouTube so that when we do go to actually make uh, the, the surplus uh, that people have had the opportunity to see what the proposal is. Thank you, Mr. Morgan.